God. Attention, Generation X and Millennials. Are you a game master in Jeopardy, Scategories, or Taboo? Then join us on Friday, October 13th at 6 p.m. at Loveland Fontana as SFC presents Game Night. We'll see you then. for Saturday, September 23rd. And bring all your friends, your neighbors, your grandkids, your kids, your cousins. Bring them all out. Hope to see you all there. We had a great time at the I Know God concert last Friday night. The house was packed. People were delivered from bondages 
And most of all, we had people. Are angels real? How many are there? What about demons? Can they hurt me? What are cherubim? What do they look like? Do angels eat? Coming soon to Loveland. Angelology, a free in-person four-week class on Wednesday nights. To just agree with you in prayer concerning anything. Do you have something to write with? Write this number down. It's on your screen. It's 667 776 9219. That's 667 776 9219. You can call that number Monday through Friday. Attention, Generation X and Millennials. Are you a game master in Jeopardy, Scategories, or Taboo? Then join us on Friday, October 13th at 6 p.m. at Loveland Fontana as SFC presents Game Night. We'll see you then. for Saturday, September 23rd. And bring all your friends, your neighbors, your grandkids, your kids, your cousins. Bring them all out. Hope to see you all there. We had a great time at the I Know God concert last Friday night. The house was packed. People were delivered from bondages. And most of all, we had people decide to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior for the very first time. Did you miss it? Well, we're going to air it on our website in the next few weeks. And we've got great events like this coming up in the near future. Professional athletes to entertainment celebrities and members of churches across the country. It's been my joy to be a counselor on marriage and romance. And some of those great stories of relationships have been exciting. Some have been beautiful, fairy tale like experiences. Some of them have been very dramatic. Some have been violent. Uh, some have been happily ever after. And some have been, I hope he don't follow after. It's been quite an experience. And what we've written in this book are some of those exciting stories.
All right, all right. Somebody give God some praise in this place. Praise the Lord. Come on, can we praise him for our victories this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody praise him for your victory this morning. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, y'all can clap if y'all want to. Come on, a simple song is just set. My enemies, they surround me, but you gave me victory, so I call you victory, and I'll march these walls until they fall, cause you gave me victory, so I call you victory.
say I'm living victorious. Uh, I'm living victorious. I'm living victorious. I'm living victorious. Very victorious. 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 Sunday. So we're going to be talking about victory the whole time. Amen. Look, let me, can I say something real quick? And I've been meaning to say this for a while, man. You know, some of us live lives and we don't have that grandiose testimony, right? And so we kind of feel some kind of way sometimes. But let me encourage you just a little bit. The fact that you don't have that grandiose testimony is a testimony within itself, amen? Because that just shows how God's been watching over you and your household and everything that you've been doing, amen? So I don't want you to feel left out because your testimony has always been there. I don't want you to get comfortable either because your, your normal circumstance doesn't have to be that normal, amen? Amen. And that's when our testimonies come about because somebody's normal got rocked and got tested, right? So I need somebody who understands how victorious they have been all their lives because they don't have a grandiose testimony because God's been watching over you and everything that you do even when you mess up. It's not like a crazy, big, massive, life-changing mess up. It's just, you know, just put something back together. Amen. So I'm just saying, realize where your blessings are because your story ain't somebody else's story. And somebody else's story ain't necessarily your story. Amen. And so I just want you to realize that and come to grips with that. Amen. Um, and so your victory is probably in your norm. Don't take it for granted, amen. <laughs> here we go, listen. We're gonna encourage you right here. Though weapons may be formed, they won't prosper. And though the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Listen, cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Is that the God you serve this morning? And I know this, my God will never fail. Is that anybody in here this morning? That understands that that God will never fail. Here we go. Though weapons may be formed, but they won't prosper. And though the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Come on, can y'all say that with me? Come on, say it, my God. My God will never fail. Listen, this is why. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the Let's worship. 
worship together. Hallelujah. Because there's power in the mighty name of Jesus. And every war he wages, he will win. And no, I'm not backing down from any giants. I know how this story ends. Can somebody lift those hands if you know how it is? I know how this story ends. Come on, lift it up. Say it. I'm going to see a victory.
set free And you turn it for good Turn it for good I need y'all to understand that You take what the enemy meant for me And you turn it for good Cause you may be going through a little something right now But he's taking what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it You turn it For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on and give God some praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Would you lift your hands and let's just worship him again. Uh, you know, it's a continual worship. Uh, it's a continual. And when, when, when we say that it's not just Sunday morning, it is the entire gathering is corporate worship where we together worship him. But it's to teach us that worship is a lifestyle. You ought to get up in the morning worshiping the Lord. The book puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 7, the inward man is renewed day by day. Day by day. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle. God. Hallelujah. We say thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a great big hand praise if you can. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. Welcome to Loveland Church. Glad you could join us today in person or online or by television. Whichever way you come, we are glad you are here as our guest. We're not going to call you a visitor. You're a guest. Maybe perhaps you'll go from being a guest to being a member. There's a great work here. If you're strong, we need you. If you're weak, you need us. Either way, we're glad that you've come to be with us today at Loveland Church. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for our guest again. Amen. Loveland Church meets in the high desert, uh, Victorville, Hesperia area of Southern California. We meet in Santa Monica along the beach. I drove down there the other day, and I'm telling you, I just wanted to go and jump in the water. But it was, it was dark when I got there. Besides that, it was cold. Besides that, I didn't have any swimming trunks. Uh, but uh, what a blessing it is to have our fellowship in Santa Monica and here in Fontana. And in case you didn't know it, Fontana is a Espanol word. It's a Fontana word. It's a Spanish word. Fontana means I'm waiting for somebody to finish it. It means fountain. That's right. So we got water at Santa Monica. We got water in Fontana and dryness in the desert. So, uh, but from the desert to the sea, we welcome you to Loveland Church. Glad that you could be with us today. Amen. It's a... Uh, Always special, but it's a specially special day today because our sermon is going to be Q&A, questions and answers. And so sharpen your question if you're ready and you better hurry because 
We got so many already coming online and some that we didn't finish from the earlier service online, but that's going to be our message for the day. And we, we will look at God's word. We live in a world, we live in a world that is filled with questions. Did you know that? Uh, that's a question. The world has a lot of questions. And here's the worst part. Having questions is not so bad. The world has a lot of answers that are not true. That are not true. Oh, uh, the problem is not what we know. The biggest problem is what we think we know. And, and so much confusion comes from false answers, philosophies, religions, lifestyle viewpoints. And so we're going to see from God's word some of the answers to the hot questions of the day. And uh, that'll be our message for today. Uh, one of the things that we normally do at this point is I start off and then I, I turn it over to this little lady and she gives a little homily on giving because one of the answers about life is giving. Watch, watch something that Jesus said. He said something really powerful. It's a big statement. Watch, Jesus said this and most folks miss it. But watch what he said. Here's the solution to life. Uh, it's an answer to marriage. It's an answer to friendship. It's an answer to finance. It's an answer to jobs. Here's what he said. Give. Wow. Give, and it shall be given unto you. So, uh, look, give is a big word, uh, but then he makes a promise right behind it, and it'll be given to you. Uh, and, and then, what? don't rush too fast past the word give, and don't rush too fast past, and it shall be given unto you. Because he said this, if you do this, here's what's going to happen. And then he explained it. Good measure. That means a whole lot. Press down. Why is that? He says, we're going to press it down so we can get more in. What's the next one? Running over, shaken together, shall men give to your bosom. And so it's a promise from Almighty God that here's what happens when you learn how to trust me with giving. Now, he didn't say when. He didn't say immediately. He didn't say 20 years from now either. But he said it will happen. And so we based on his promise. Uh, Dr. Manuel Scott, Dr. Manuel Scott Sr., Dr. Manuel Scott said something. I heard him say it 30 some years ago. He said this. He said that sometimes God's gift to the tither is a blessing on your children. Wow. And some people will say, well, never mind them, you know. <laughs> but they can be a bigger blessing than you know. Sometimes he just will bless you with a really good son or daughter or straightening out something for them. And your gift extends for generations as a result. And sometimes his blessing is a better job. Sometimes the blessing is peace of mind. And for some people, often giving is permission to have a good night's sleep. Wow. Uh, just with the assurance, the security of knowing that I'm right smack dab in the center of God's will. Ooh. That's, that's wonderful. And we are a church that is known for giving, and we thank God for that. What a privilege it is to be a given church. Um, one of our members who's here almost every Sunday was here at the earlier service, uh, Estella Crawford, who I teased about how many years she worked managing our Sunrise Senior Citizens Housing Complex. We got living proof of what we do a multi-million dollar housing 
housing for the homeless, complex for senior citizens. That is fantastic. We got people on the mailing list. One or two of them are calling me and say, Pastor Chuck, I got to have a place. We don't have enough. But now in a few weeks, we're going to announce. I'm told, don't, don't announce it right now. So in a few weeks, we're going to be announcing uh, what we're doing with some housing in Moreno Valley. And I'm not announcing it right now. <laughs> and in Paris, California. And uh, we do have hopes of doing more in the Rialto Fontana, San Bernardino, Riverside area as well. And we're working very hard on getting that done. I, I would say it would be done already if the government and COVID would get out of the way. Uh, but, we, you know, we respect leadership and we respect uh, those in authority. And uh, so we try to follow the rules and California... <laughs> It, permits after permits. You have to get some permits that permit you to get another permit. Um, but we've been working for quite a while on getting that done. Thank God for our staff. Uh, the, the guy who's really... Uh, <laughs> hey, look, give a hand clap. Yeah. The guy who's really uh, in, in, inspired and does a lot of our uh, compliance work to get all them permits is uh, gonna be up here in a few minutes. And he's gonna lead us in our offertory prayer and that's uh, Pastor Re Reginald Young. And praise God for you. Reginald, Roger Langford, Christopher Singleton, um, and uh, oh, there's several others that work at Chuck and others that work as well as our board. And we praise God for them. There's much to be done to get more housing for the homeless. So we're going to keep on doing that. Your tithes, your offering, help us to get that done. There's something else we want to thank you for with your giving. Something else we want to praise God for you because you helped make it possible. But I'm going to have Chuck Singleton come up and tell you what that is. Uh, I'm, my name is Chuck Singleton. This guy's name is Chuck Singleton. Amen. So before we pray, our deacons will go ahead and receive our tithes and offering. Go ahead, Pastor Chuck. I'm going to share something with you, but first we're going to show you some mid-service announcements. So direct your attention to the LED wall, the screens, and then I'll be right back. Attention, Generation X and Millennials. Are you a game master in Jeopardy, Scategories, or Taboo? Then join us on Friday, October 13th at 6 p.m. at Loveland, Fontana as SFC presents Game Night. We'll see you then. For a great time of food, fellowship, and fun with your Loveland family, mark your calendar for Saturday, September 23rd, and bring all your friends, your neighbors, your grandkids, your kids, your cousins, bring them all out. Hope to see you all there. We had a great time at the I Know God concert last Friday night. The house was packed. People were delivered from bondages, and most of all, we had people decide to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior for the very first time. Did you miss it? Well, we're going to air it on our website in the next few weeks, and we've got great events like this coming up in the near future. Are angels real? How many are there? What about demons? Can they hurt me? What are cherubim? What do they look like? Do angels eat? 
Coming soon to Loveland. Angelology, a free in-person four-week class on Wednesday nights. Friday night. This was an evangelistic tool. This was an evangelistic opportunity. Let me tell you what happened briefly. We started that concert at 8 o'clock. Around just about 11, the artist that had come out, Brian T., uh, D1, Antoine Hill, the others that came, Mr. Pickney. First of all, understand, these artists, they're not just rap artists. These guys are ordained and licensed pastors that preach their sermons through lyrics. So they came, they gave us a concert, and at the end of the concert, Brian T. came up and gave an altar call. And do you know that not one, not two, but three people gave their lives to the Lord for the very first time? Look, one would have been enough, but three people had their eternity changed. Three people were snatched out of the jaws of hell as a result of that concert. Not only did we have the three that gave their lives to Jesus Christ, we had dozens that decided to rededicate their lives to Jesus Christ. It was about 1130 that night, about 1130 that I said the closing prayer. And after I said the closing prayer, I figured, you know, people would leave. Nobody left. Nobody left. We still had a couple hundred, actually almost 300 people that were here because the artists had come forward and they said, if anybody needs special prayer, come forward to the altar. So nobody left at 1130. We were here until after midnight because the Spirit of God was moving so powerfully. That's why we bring these artists out so that they can lead people to Jesus. But can I tell you something? It wasn't just about the artist doing an altar call, and it wasn't just about the artist laying hands on people and praying for them. You had a hand in that. You had a hand in that altar call. You had a hand in leading those people to Christ. How? Because of your tithes and offering. We couldn't have done that without the tithe and offering. And now I believe, I believe when you get to heaven, you're going to get a thank you because you helped lead somebody to an eternity with God in heaven. So, so, so what's the point really briefly? I want to tell you two things. One, we're going to be doing more of those things in the future. We're going to be doing an even bigger one coming up in the spring. And when we do, we need two things from you. One, come and volunteer to help out. Because look, whether you are serving food in the back or handing out flyers, whatever you do, you're going to get the same reward as the person that is up here telling people about Jesus because it takes a body. So come and help us out. And two, keep praying. Keep praying because God is doing something in this church. Really quickly before Reverend Young comes, I want to say a special thank you to three people, actually a lot of people that made that happen. One is our House of Hope guys. I think some of them are here because they cleaned up all these chairs. Thank you, House of Hope people. We appreciate you guys. Two, I want to say a special thank you to our media team. You don't see most of them because they're behind the scenes. But they were here Friday night, all five hours of that production. Then they were here the next morning, Saturday, for my grandmother's home going. They were back on Sunday morning for service. Thank you, media team, for your service. And lastly, I want to say a very special thank you. I don't know if she's here. Karen Moore, Carol Dubois, and Michael Noble. I don't know if they're here anywhere, but they were here for all three of those events. There's Carol Dubois right there. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Michael. Reverend Lawrence Mulligan, you're here somewhere too. Thank you because you are one of the visionaries for that event. Praise God. Reverend Young. And happy birthday to Reverend Young's wife, Lisa Young. He was going to say that too. Amen. Amen. We bless the Lord for my wife, Lisa. We celebrated her birthday last night. But going back to the point here at hand, 
because of your giving, because of the uh, dedication that you have in serving. And as Pastor said, I don't have to repeat it again, but we're doing work all around the world. All because of you. It really is. We got the victory. Somebody shout, we got the victory. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. The deacons are waiting. They need to have us bless the offering, so let's do that. We bless the Lord, Father God, for all persons that's given on today. Lord God, move. We thank you, Father, our First Lady, Lord, she's a, she's a giver. She is a tithe payer. She's a sower into your kingdom. And Father God, we bless you, Father God, for our leadership. Lord, today, have your way. Move, Father God, on all persons' heart to continue to give to the kingdom. There's so much work for us to do, Lord. There's so much work. So right now, Father God, bless these seeds that's been sown in the fertile soil we call Loveland. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And bless the Lord. Amen. Whew. Amen. Victory belongs to Jesus. How many of us walking in that victory that belongs to Jesus? Because if you belong to him, then victory belongs to you. The question is, are you believing in every step you take? Is every step you're taking victorious? Or... Or you walking unsure. So, hopefully this encourages you. Just a little bit. Who can stand against the Lord? No one can. And no one will. Who can stand against the King? No one can, and no one will. Oh, 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 victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Him. Oh, 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 victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to him. Come on, if you believe that, sing that word and say, Who can stand? Who can stand against the Lord? No one. No one can. And no one will. Who can stand against the King? Who can stand against the King? No one can. No one can. No one. Victory belongs to him. Come on, if you believe that, say that with us. Oh, 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 oh. Victory. Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to him. Say who can stand, say who can stand against the Lord? No one can, no one will, no one will. Say who 
You can stand against the king. Yeah. No one can. No one can. No one Victory belongs. Victory belongs to Jesus. I need my victorious people to stand on their feet and say, Oh. the voices in this place say oh, oh victory belongs victory belongs to him oh oh victory belongs to Jesus victory belongs to him yes victory Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. Come on and sing it like you believe it. Who did tell? Say, I don't stand to get me behind. Victory. Victory today is mine. Said victory. Victory is mine. Victory. Because victory, victory today is mine. Say victory is mine. Say victory is mine. Victory is mine. Say victory is mine. Say I told Satan he gotta go. You got to get up out the way. Because victory today. Victory today. Yeah.
Come on, everybody that knows that victory belongs to Jesus. Clap your hands. Ah, my God. Father, we, we do declare victory belongs to Jesus. And we thank you for that truth. And as we draw ever nigh, your book tells us, draw nigh to God and he will draw near to you. So victory is ours as well. We thank you for that. Bless now the house. Bless those who listen uh, in person here today and those who are joining us via television, online. Let your word speak to our hearts and we give you the glory and all the honor and praise in that fine name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Give the Lord a great big hand. Praise if you would, please. Amen. <laughs> praise God. Questions and answers today. And as we prepare for that, if you have a question, you note that the microphone's right over, over here. And I think there's going to be one over there as well. So uh, get ready for that. But let's start with a scripture. There's a powerful passage in the word of God that every child of God who plans to live any time during the next 20 years. So if you're not going to be here, you don't need this verse. Uh, but if you are, you do. And it, it comes from uh, Paul's letter to the uh, disciple Timothy, 2 Timothy, in fact, chapter number three. And it speaks to this day. If you listen, I know you'll get this. It speaks to the day that you and I are living in. It speaks to the day. I said earlier that our world is filled with questions. And that our world is filled with answers. Most of the answers are not true. But they come at you pretty strong. And here's something you ought to know about those false answers. Philosophies, false philosophies, false religions that come your way. They are deceptive. If you look just a little closer, come here, come here. If you look just a little closer, you will see the truth of this book just a little closer. I learned this a long time ago when I was in uh, college studying what we call apologetics. We got a few of our young pastors, ministers in this church who are going to be studying that topic, apologetics. It sounds like apologizing, same root, but doesn't mean apologizing. It's, it means defending, defending, defending. So defending the faith because many deceivers have gone out into the world. Now, now watch what Paul instructed Timothy regarding that. Look at this beginning in verse one. You'll see it right away. When you get a revelation on something, just say amen as we read. Uh, Paul says, but I know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers disobedient to parents. That one seems like it doesn't fit, but it fits right in. I'll show you how in a moment. Unthankful, unholy. I'm not preaching this. This is a Q&A, so get your cue ready. Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, Haughty, 
lovers of marijuana. Oh, wait, that's not, that doesn't say marijuana, does it? Hashish. No, no, it doesn't say that either, does it? Uh, Colombian uh, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Here, here's where it gets deceptive, tricky. See, watch this, where it gets tricky. Having a form of godliness. And from such people, turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women. In the King James, it says, silly women. Loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. And, and here in verse 7 is a verse that is for you. you. You know who I'm talking to. I don't even know who I'm talking to, but you do. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It might appear that this next verse is irrelevant to the whole argument, but it is not. Watch how it reads. Now, as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. But they will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. So we're living in what we'll call, and we ought to call, and the Bible calls the last days. Uh, we live in the last days. And, and if, if you're not carefully, keen, awake, uh, excuse me, Governor, if you're not awake, Woke, uh, you will miss, you will miss the reality of what's going on around us. You know, it's kind of like the frog in the kettle. You throw him in hot water, he tries to jump out. You put him in and warm it up slowly, you cook him. Um, the, the world and the evil around us is warming up slowly. You know, to the point where, you know, now I don't like that on Wednesday, but by Saturday, so many people liked it. Okay, <laughs> why not? Um, and, uh, and so the enemy has a, a trick, one that you've no doubt heard God in his word talk about many times before. It's the word uh, deception. Um, th there's one passage which is like a Christmas passage. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, when uh, King Herod heard about the wise men coming, the Magi, um, and he told them, uh, you know, hey, stop on by. I heard y'all come because there's a king that's supposed to be born. Stop on by the palace here. I want to talk to you. And, uh, and you know, when you find him, he said, come back and let me know where he is because, you know, we all want to worship. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and uh, the Magi didn't stop back by. And, and verse 16 of Matthew 2 says, when the king realized they had some translations, I think the King James says, they had deceived him, which they really didn't do. What happened is that God told them don't go back. Don't go back. And so they went around the other way. 
And when but the book says when he realized they deceived them, well, that word deceived uh, is a, uh, a Greek word, emphadizo. Um, and that's why some translations don't translate it deceived. They translate it outwitted. 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 Outsmarted. Like checkers, chess. Ah, uh, their move messed him up. And you need to know that what we're dealing with in the spirit realm is somewhat similar to, but a million times bigger than a chess game. Some stuff that's coming. Some that's all all we're here is a matter of chess moves. And that's why the Bible talks about a form of godliness. But denying the power thereof. So uh, some deceivers will quote a scripture. And what the devil is thinking right there is got you. All you saints <laughs> over there in love land. <laughs> You're going to like it because he quoted a scripture. And uh, but you remember the devil quoted scripture. When he came up against the Lord Jesus. Even though Lord Jesus was quoted scripture, the devil qu quoted scripture too. He can quote scripture. Well, the devil believes. James, the book of James says, uh, even the devil believes and trembles. And, and you know, trembles, literally, uh, his hair stands up on his head when he hears about God. He got to believe in God. Obviously, he knows better than you do. But uh, deception is another story. So there's philosophies, ideas, beliefs out there that are deceptive. All right, I'm going to take first question. Uh, uh, okay, Exodus 20, verse 12. Um, Honor thy father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord has given you. Now, right away, I'm looking for what the question is. Um, what's the what is the question about that particular verse? Is that um, for adult believers who were not, quote, raised by one or both parents? Also, there's been a continued absence of sacrifice and priority of the child by the parent well into childhood. So adulthood. Well, what they're saying is that they weren't raised by great parents um, and. Uh, Everybody in the house that was raised by perfect parents. Let's start right there. Uh, say amen if that's you. All right. Nobody said amen. Um, I was raised by some great people. My father, Dr. Isaac Singleton, my mother, Dr. Pearl Singleton, great people. But they weren't perfect. And uh, one of the ways I know they weren't perfect, but that very thing made them more perfect than many parents is that they let me see their imperfections. So I was able to see that I didn't have to be perfect. The, the whole idea of the Christian faith, the big word in the Christian faith is not perfection, it's forgiveness. Amen. One, of, one of the greatest moments in my life uh, since I've been saved is when my father unexpectedly I'm a grown man came to me and apologized for ways and things that he might have said or done when I was a child. I was like, what? I don't remember that, Pops. He's apologizing to me. But I knew how sincere he was, so I let him. And when he finished, I said, Dad, I, I don't remember any problems with that, but I thank you. You know, he said sometimes he was meaner to us than he meant to be. This was a moment when I went home to preach, and there were, I mean, thousands of people uh, at church, and among them were all of my uh, athletic teammates from high school. 
And they came over the house afterwards and we're sitting there having a great, and he's watching these kids, all of our knuckleheads were there too. And he did fuss at us a few times, but we needed it and we knew it. And it was cool, you know, but he apologized. And, and you know, it brought tears to my eyes. Um, you won't have perfect earthly fathers, but you do have a perfectly heavenly father. Jesus took all the burden out of you having to find perfect parents when for the first time, when they asked him how to pray, instead of saying to them, go there and say, oh, great God that sits high and looks low, who formed the constellations, who spoke and everything came out of nothing. Oh, God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, oh, great God who made the heavens and the earth. He didn't say all that. He said, here's how I want you to pray. Our father which are in heaven. You only have one perfect father and that's God, your father. So forgive those that fail and accept the one who never fails. Give him all the glory. If you need counseling about something you've been through with your parents, come on, come on in. We got some staff that can help you with that. There's word in the word that can help you uh, with that problem. So uh, come and see us about that. That, that there seems to be a follow up to that one from a practical perspective. What does honor towards the father and mother look like? Example, prayer, one or two calls per week, month, et cetera. From the adult child's perspective, you just went into the law. Uh, so I got to give you exact rules. No, actually, honor is in, in the Greek language and the Hebrew are uh, two words that, together. Um, one is consistent. Respect. Consistent respect. Now, all that means is this. Um, when you're doing real great, telling me how great I am, um, I respect you. When you flub up, mess up, and I know it, I respect you. And uh, that pays off. That kind of takes us to the question that came this morning, and I'm going to segue to that one, which had to do with uh, um, this very popular thing that's happening where there are people who ask me, I'm going to, I'm going to read the question. Here's the way it goes. Why is it that when we talk about worshiping the ancestors, did y'all hear what I said so far? When we talk about worshiping the ancestors, y'all say the blood of Jesus against that. You fear everything African and worship European. Why can't we worship ancestors? Um, and, and that was a deep one this morning. It's a deep one now. And so let's, let's try to get to it. What, what they did, of course, right now, watch the deception. Here's the deception. Uh, why is it you fear everything African? I don't know, what's the chair up here for anyway? Just... This is for you, Pastor, just in case you don't know. You fear everything African and worship European. That's deception. Do you get that? Do you see the deception in that? Yeah. So what, what they did is just attached your race, your culture to a false teaching. So all you're going to do is answer the question straight up. No, 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 no. Let me look at your question. Uh, you just said it was African. And so what what I did is uh, show that that is not a simply an African thing. Let me show you several cultures where the worship of ancestors is practiced that are not African. Just to disambiguate, just to detach the idea that it's African uh, from that question. I'll come back to your question. I'm going to answer it. But first, I want you to see that it's not an African thing. Um, the worship of ancestors, that is conjuring them up, calling upon them, uh, imitating them, pretending to be them so you can worship is not simply an African thing. One of the first cultures that I bring to you are the Sarada from India. They believe in ancestor worship. Wrong. Voodoo. Some Voodoo from Ghana. Also, 
You notice anything strange about that word? I'll come back to it in a minute. Dia de los Muertos from Mexico. Um, you've seen that one. The Day of the Dead. All right. Uh, venerated saints from Rome. Though from this one, uh, literally the name is Parentalia, Rome. And uh, Parentalia, you see the first part of that? What? Say it again. Parent. Uh, so the parents. And from that, when the gospel came to uh, much of Italy and several other parts and South America, uh, they noticed the people wanted to remember people who already died and call upon them to help them. And so they replaced parentalia with a thing called the saints. Somebody said it. So we call upon the saints. He dead and gone, but you know what? Maybe you can help me. Uh, Christopher, I'm getting ready to travel. St. Christopher, uh, help me out as I make my way along the road. So the veneration of saints, the shy ceremony from China, uh, corpse standing. So what happens is family gathers and uh, let's say you're in my family and you represent my father. So you're a corpse for that day. Y'all mighty quiet this morning. I'm just... <laughs> the megalithic tomes from Europe. So the Europeans had these big tomes, 12 foot tall, and uh, the Celtics in particular. Okay, we say Celtics because of, you know, Boston basketball team. Uh, <clears throat> but the Celtics had megalithic tomes. What's one of them that you can think of? Anybody know the tall tombs from Europe? The British Isles, Stonehenge, is one example of that. Uh, that Pichum Ben from Cambodia, that's a Buddhist practice. Samhain from Scotland, that coming along real soon will be a thing called Halloween is uh, where that originally came from. The Shinto rites from Japan, Kemai, which are the spirits, and Peganito from the Philippines. Um, if you take the P-A-G off the front, Anito means spirit in um, their original language, the uh, um, uh, Tagwa. And uh, so then, then the Chushiak from Korea, which is their form of Thanksgiving, both in North and South Korea, and the Kalen Gaith from Wales. So these ancestor worships, you can see it's from everywhere. Not an African thing. Amen? amen. Some will ask y'all to say amen. I'll do that more because y'all Y'all sitting there learning like you're in an anthropology class. So I just, I just um, so so it, it, it's something that has happened everywhere. But why? Why? Let me show you this in Romans. You got a Bible? Look at Romans chapter one. And let me show you something awesome in uh, verse number 18. Watch this. For the wrath of God. Somebody say the wrath of God. The wrath. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. That's bigger than it might look. So you, you could find me easy. That's what he just said. It's manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, before they got around to making religions, whether African or Asian or Gaelic. His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him. Uh, which which, which uh, race is he talking about? Which nationality is he speaking of? All of them. Uh, look, look, listen to what he says. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And change the glory 
of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the question this morning was, okay, can you worship and should we worship? And is it right to worship our ancestors? And so uh, this thing is travel around social media. And if, if you haven't run into it yet, you will. And if you plan to stick around for the next 20 years, it'll come up. It'll come up. If you want to make a difference in this world, you ought to get ready for it to come up. To be able to answer when your children, grandchildren, neighbors, co-workers begin to deal with this question. Uh, because it's already out there. It's already traveling around. And you ought to be ready to deal with it. Here's one way to deal with it. Uh, note the story. This is in the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, somebody say book of Luke. In the book of Luke chapter 16, you have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I, I'm not going to read it, but if you read it beginning yourself in verse 20, you begin to see the unfolding of truth about the afterlife. Here's what happened. Rich man died. Beggar named Lazarus died. Rich man looks out across eternity and somehow sees Abraham. Abraham has all the righteous folks with him. The rich man is burning in Hades. And he calls out to Abraham. He said, look, Abraham, could you, I see Lazarus over there, would you, would you tell him just to put a drop of water on his fingertip and just bring it to lay it on my tongue. And Abraham said, nah. <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it. And then he explains why. He says, there is a gulf between you and us. We can't cross it. There's a gulf. Uh, we might look at it a little different, say a wall, um, uh, or we might look at it like a canyon, uh, that it's so impenetrable that we can't get to you, even if we wanted to. He said, oh, okay, well, then have him go back from the dead, go back. <laughs> I know he's dead, but have him go back to my brothers and let them know because I don't want them coming where I am. And Abraham says, can't do that either. He says, because they got Moses and they got the prophets. In other words, the Old Testament, they've got the word of God. And if they're not persuaded by God's word, Neither will they be persuaded by someone that comes back from the dead. Can my grandfather, <laughs> can my great, great uncle come back? Can my mama, my daddy come back? And according to what we just read, no. And in fact, it'd be useless. Uh, it would be not worth it. Uh, uh, would, would they change if they saw what's on the other side? No. The book says they would not be likely at all to change. Uh, let me show you one other thing about it, just to make sure you got it. As a believer, uh, this, this is the reason why? This comes from Hebrews chapter number four. Ain't nobody taking any notes. I guess you're going to use the, uh, the video later on. I'm coming back to you. Watch this in Hebrews four. And in fact, I'm going to take you before I get to Hebrews four. I got two questions. What's your question? Come to the mic, please. 
I know you have a challenge, but we're going to accept your challenge. Here comes Chase to help you out. Thank you. Uh, can you... Go ahead. Can you speak on the, uh, the things that the Jehovah Witnesses believe that there are only 144,000 to go to heaven? Yeah. What, what are they thinking? That they try to kick out people so they can get in? Everybody that is Jehovah Witness try to think they go to heaven, but yet everybody from the Jehovah Witnesses are kicking one another out of there so that they can get in. What do we say? What are the wordings? My heart bleeds for them. Amen. Thank you. You know, you notice how she said, yo, Jehovah, Jehovah's Witness, and not Jehovah's Witness. Uh, she's from Holland. Her name is Johanna. It's spelled like Johanna <laughs> with that silent J. That's for all those folks that have a problem with uh, Jesus. J, anyway, that's another subject. Um, so 144,000, you have to understand, 1944, when they started off, there wasn't 144,000. There were only a few. And then there were a few hundred. And then there were a few thousand. And then there was 100,000. And then there was more than 100,000. And now there are millions. So it would seem to imply that not all of the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to go uh, by virtue of their original documents. They're working on that. Keep your eye on the watchtower. They'll let us know how God's going to fix that. I'm being sarcastic, but obviously they out prophesied themselves with false doctrine. Um, Here's the truth about it. When you read in Revelation about the 144,000, they were there and the word of God said, I saw 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Didn't mean that only members of the tribes of Israel, but from them, I saw 144,000. 12 times 12 is 144. So I saw 12. Tribes with 12 times 12, 144,000. But then in the next few verses, here's what it says. And beyond them was another number that could not be numbered of every tribe, of every language, of every nation. Another tribe that could not, another number that could not be numbered. So uh, for the saved, for those that God is saving. It's as simple as by grace through faith we are saved and uh, not indeed the uh, uh, false teachings of uh, the Jehovah Witness. That might sound rude and it is. Okay. So the, the, the real is this. We, we just talked. We started off by talking about deception. There are so many false, fake Almost religions. And watch how you read it. You read it right there when Paul's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. Have a form of God. Who, did, who said that? Sherman, was that you? Was that? Yeah. Thank you, sis. Form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Uh, what is, look, look at the power. There's two things you ought to know when, when the word of God says denying the power. First of all, the power to save. Got it. Okay, so what does that mean? The power to save is this. It is not you that saves you. It's not me that saves me. It is God who has the power to save. If I could do it, I would have. But then if I do it, I would have blew it. So it's based not on what I do and blew. It's based on what I knew when I came to the cross and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved by faith, by grace, through faith, and not through my own work. Somebody say amen if you can. Amen. It is what he did on the cross, not what I do myself that saves my soul. Amen. Philip, are you going to, Mike, go ahead up there. 
Okay, so um, my question is, um, uh, I, I, I hear about the denominations, and um, in regards to denominations, they're sects of Christendom, from what they say, and my question is, are they Christian? For example, is Seventh Day Adventist Christian because they have a fundamental core belief that Christ died, rose from the dead, yet they don't believe that we go to hell. Um, there's other Christian sects that takes away themes from the Bible but call themselves Christians, but without these themes in the Bible, it, now the scripture has loose ends. So for me, are Baptist, Seventh Day Adventist, Methodist, Evangelical, Amish, are they considered Christian when they take away themes from the Bible um, that make up the entirety of the Bible? That's a good question. Thank you, sir. Okay. Philip's one of those young brothers I was telling you about. We are digging deep. Part of what we're digging into, as we said, is apologetics. Just how do you defend the faith in the world we live in? Look, folks, come here. That's important. That's important. Uh, maybe not nearly as important uh, for you or me, but it's important if you're going to be here for the next 40 years. Uh, I probably will be. I don't plan to be boxing with a whole bunch of unbelievers. Then again, I might. <laughs> Become old Chuck. Um, okay, false doctrine. There are people who will have mistaken beliefs that will, if I'm reading the Bible correctly, make it in. Yes, there are some who will make it in, though their belief is not perfect. So let's divide it. Here's, here's how you look at it. There are what we call doctrine, what the word of God calls Sound doctrine. It is a solid, stolid, steel fabric of the truth. But that steel fabric of the truth begins at the cross. Amen. At the cross, at the cross. I'm trying not to preach, but I can't help it. When I get to the cross, I get that way. Uh, where I first saw the light. Uh, so at the cross, the steel fabric and the foundation of everything else is the cross. That's the reason why Paul said in Galatians 6, God forbid that I should glory in anything save the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, so it starts at that cross and the blood of Jesus on that cross. If I get it right about Jesus, um, I got the main thing. And the main thing is to keep the main thing, <laughs> the main thing. Now I can step away from that. I can step further from that. And there are other things that happen. Like, for example, he says, uh, uh, believe and be baptized. All right. So this this Tuesday, I'll be with uh, some of the highest ranking Methodists um, in the world. I have no intention to challenge them on sprinkling. Although I from from my heart, I believe that if you're going to do what Jesus said, you're getting in the water and you're going to go down under the water. <laughs> he said he said it's burial. So I believe you ought to get in the water, even though we don't have a pool up here. Uh, but we baptize in the pool. You're going in the water. I tell our deacons, make sure you get everything under the water, including his pocketbook, everything going underneath there <laughs> to get baptized. And that's a that's a, a biblical truth. But watch now. Uh, the Methodists don't necessarily dunk. Some do. One of the, one of the Methodists that will be on that call does. Um, that, um, that, that they don't always put them in the water. Methodists, Catholics, Episcopalians, uh, Lutherans sprinkle. They throw the dirt. And I've never seen them at the cemetery throwing dirt on a dead man unless he was in the ground <laughs> first. Uh, so I believe in, in immersion. Baptism. Um, but is that going to keep him out of heaven? I don't believe so. I don't. I know some Baptists who I really will be surprised if they make it. 
<laughs> and I, I've seen some of them hold a guy underwater so long, thought the dude was going to drown. Uh, but, uh, but baptism doesn't save. Amen? Amen. So, so I, can, I can be, I, I'll say it this way, I have a little wiggle room on baptism. On the blood, absolutely not. On the cross, no wiggle room at all. On baptism, okay, I see you, you're wrong, but I see you. And, uh, and then there's the question of what we call eternal security. Now, I happen to believe when you read the bulk of the scripture, it seems to infer that you get saved and you walk with the Lord by faith, that he fills you with his spirit and you stay saved. You stay saved. Uh, you sin, you stay saved. You might get a spanking. In fact, you will get a spanking. And in fact, you might get more than a spanking. He might take you home early. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter, I just had to throw those in, chapter 11, uh, that he can take a believer home for sin. That's not bad. No, no worse than a mother who takes her child to a birthday party and the child keeps acting up at the party and she says, okay, that's it. You're going home, you know. Uh, I believe God has, and I've seen him, I believe, do that to some believers who, who continued in sin. So I believe that. Um, but did he lose his salvation? No, not according to 1 Corinthians 5. Not according to 1 Corinthians 5. That is a particular case where this guy was, I, I, it's in the Bible, so I have to lay it out. He was sleeping with his stepmother, and, and he was in sin. And they wrote a letter to Paul and asked, well, what should we do? Paul said, put him out. Put him out of the church. And uh, they did. And so and here's what he said. He said, so his soul can be saved. His body will be destroyed so his soul can be saved. Amen? Amen. Now, later on in 2 Corinthians, you find Paul saying this. Now bring him back because I heard he repented. I heard he repented. So bring him back. Um, am I way off target from what you asked? That, that, that's, the, that's the question and that's the answer. That the reality is that uh, God chastens the ones that he loves. Amen. Someone else. Someone else. Chase. Yes, sir. Chase what matters. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, in relation to what you were talking about with the people saying worshiping the ancestors uh, Hebrews 12 therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing your eyes on Jesus the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith my grandma recently just passed Yes. When he calls for the cloud of witnesses, what is meant by that in terms of them either being there to support us or before us? As you've heard some people say, oh, my grandma's my guardian angel now. Mm -hmm. What does that actual cloud of witness reference and what was he talking about? Thank you, Chase. That's an excellent question. Let me say for, for right away, I really appreciate that question. And here's the truth about it, that the great cloud of witnesses, I believe, speaks about the saints that have gone on. And in fact, in the context, the verses around it, it shows this what he's talking about. So do I believe that uh, your grandmother, great grandmother, other family can see and know you? Yes, I believe it. I believe that's what it's referencing, that they can see what you're doing. They can see your life and praise God. Um, you live a godly life as a a good man, and I believe they can see you. Um, now, they're not angels. They weren't angels when they were here. They're not angels now. You hear people say that, and sometimes at a funeral service, I have to kind of on the sly correct that, because people will say, now she's up over us as my angel, watching over each one of us. No, she ain't. And I'll tell you what the problem with it is. It, it is not that she can't it is that she doesn't need to. 
If you want help, you got help. I'm going to show you how. Look at Hebrews. Turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter number four and uh, and watch this. If you don't have it yet, don't worry. I'm going to read it. Verse 14 says, seeing then that we have, watch this, seeing then that we have, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. You conjuring up grandma. And the book says you got a high priest who's already passed through the heavens and then gives his name and identity. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Next verse. Let us therefore come. How? Boldly. Say it again. Boldly. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen, amen. Can I get two more amen on this amen. side? Of yeah. You see that what, what God wants and what you want really, if you could see it, if you if you could see the will of God as the Bible explains it, it's what you would want yourself if you had sense enough to want it. <laughs> you don't want grandma. Come on. You don't want great, great, great grand uncle uh, to come and help you. Well, watch this. Uh, and, and they don't want to do it either because they, they know they're limited. I'm going to show you couple of quick verses. Watch this one in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. For there's one God and one mediator. One God <clears throat> and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Wow. See, so what we learn, those things which show us the high point, the high pinnacle of the New Testament and, and with it, and this is what always needs to happen, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is written in the light of the cross. The Old Testament is written in the shadow of the cross. But that which was shadowed is revealed, no longer concealed. So you take, for example, some of the Old Testament passages like <clears throat> Leviticus. Let me read a couple of verses in, in Leviticus. In fact, chapter number 20. Uh, here's what God said to him in the old. Remember, this is only the concealed before the New Testament reveal. All right. So here's what was concealed. And you shall be holy to me. God says in chapter 20, verse 26. For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the people that you should be mine. A man or woman who's a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. Now, remember, this was not just the law of religion. This was the law of a nation. So you have to consider that when talking about this. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10. Watch this. These, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. If you have a King James Bible, the word would be necromancer, N-E-C-R-O-M-A-R-O-M-A-N-C-E-R. -E -E that you, you aren't to be a necromancer. 
For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. Here's what he just said. I'm taking you to the promised land. I promised you this land, land that flows with milk and honey. I'm giving you that. I'm giving you that. But there's somebody already there. I'm driving them out so I can give it to you. So as I'm driving them out to give it to you, they've been doing that stuff. So it doesn't make sense for me to drive them out because they do that stuff. And then you go in doing the same thing. I'm blessing you and I'm preparing you. Why was God so favorable towards the children of Israel? Because, come here, listen, he was preparing them for the birth of the Messiah, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to be pure. I want you to be holy. Nothing between you and me. I don't want you playing games like that. Amen. So I, I close with this. I close with this. This, this story is one in 1 Samuel uh, chapter number 28. And, and here's what had happened. The king, King Saul. Somebody say King Saul. King Saul. Say it again, King Saul. King Saul. King Saul had a problem. He looked out and the enemy, the Pharisees, not the Pharisees, but the, um, well, the enemies were around him. Palestinians now, which we call Philistines. They were surrounding him. The whole nation was surrounded. They were about to get in a bad fight. And so Saul, the king, military strategist, had to figure out what to do. So he said, I better pray. And so he tried to pray. Well, he had been in sin, bad sin. And so God wasn't listening to his prayers. He said, whoa, what am I going to do? The enemy is to the right, left, above. Everywhere I look, the enemy's there. And God's not hearing me. So he tried a lot of stuff. He tried to go through um, uh, the, the Urim and the Purim. There was different ways that they tried to hear from God. And he got nothing. But that was another way that they could look into the spirit world. Literally, they could. Besides with God. Yeah. See, if you wonder if that stuff is real, if you can really see or get into the spirit realm, if some of these mediums and spiritists and fortune tellers and soothsayers can see something, sometimes they can. They're unreliable, but sometimes they can. And so here's what King Saul said. Can anybody tell me where I can find a witch? I want a witch. And somebody said, yeah, King, there's, there's this, this lady up at Endor, the witch of Endor. You can go to her and she can see stuff. I know she can. She can see stuff. But there was a problem. Here's the problem. Saul himself had made a decree that witches could not operate in Israel under the penalty of death, that mediums and witches, male and female, if they did witchcraft, they would die. So because he did that and said that, he knew some of them were doing it anyway. But they were doing it on a sly. So he disguised himself. Took off his robes. And so he went to the witch of Endor. And uh, when he got to her, disguised. He said, I need you to call up someone from the dead. Whew. And the witch said, OK, well, wait a minute. I can do that. But, you know, you know, Saul has put out a decree and he's killing folks for that. I don't want to die. Saul, now disguised, says, go ahead. You'll be all right. Who you want? She said. And he said, I need Samuel, the prophet Samuel. Call him up from the dead. And she called. And here's the amazing thing. 
Samuel, the book says, came up from the ground. Samuel came up. But the light of that moment must have been so great that uh, when Samuel came up from the dead, the witch saw through the disguise that Saul was the king. And she said, oh, no, wait a minute. So why don't you trick me like that? You know, you, you're going to kill me now. I know because the rule says if anybody does this, that they die. Saul said, don't worry about it, woman. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to kill you. And he asked Samuel the question that he wanted answered. Samuel answered him. It basically was this, that God is going to tear the kingdom out of your hands. And you're going to die. That's the answer Saul got. But the point of me sharing the illustration, the example from 1 Samuel 28 is this. That she could communicate into the spirit world. It's possible. I don't know how. I don't know when. But I know that it's possible. And believers that uh, dabble, play, fool around in that realm need to know that you are walking on dangerous territory and you don't know exactly when and how and what is going to happen. But meanwhile, we go back to that verse we read a moment ago that we have a great high priest and his name is Jesus. So when you're dealing with spirits or the spirit world, who are you going to call? <laughs> Jesus. Not Ghostbusters. <laughs> I really believe this. I, I, believe, I believe most ghosts are scared of y'all. Scared you might get so scared that you say, oh, Jesus. <laughs> that's the last thing. That's the last thing he'd want you to do. But there are spirits and there is a spirit realm. There are ancestors. Yes, they are alive. They're not to be worshipped. Venerated is a different word. I don't have time to get to it today. It means highly esteemed. Some people venerate them to the point where they substitute them for Jesus. They think those ancestors are the mediator between God and them. Wrong. Dangerous. Wrong. Dangerous. Absolutely wrong. Absolutely dangerous. To respect them? Yes. My grandmother, I praise God. Mama Georgia. Mama Ruby. My daddy Ruby and Mama Sam. Daddy Willie. My grandpapa was a deacon in the Baptist church. Not my father's father, but my mother's father. My mother's father was a deacon in the Baptist church. My father's father, my father, a minister you know. My father's father was a gambler. Maybe you didn't know. But if you lost that gambling, you better pay him because he cut you. <laughs> I ain't calling him. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy Ruby, help! I need help. No, though I believe he's in heaven. Uh, barely in heaven. <laughs> but here's the truth about it. Because he didn't live for the Lord. It was at his last days that I was able to share Christ with him. My other grandfather, the deacon, he's in too, I believe. Barely, but he's in. Because <laughs> the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, if the righteous scarcely, barely be saved, then where does the sinner stand? We barely made it in. It's by the blood of the Lamb. 
no matter how great your grandmother, great grandmother, grandfather is, they're not good enough to stand between you and Almighty God. You need to call on the name above every name. You need to call on the name that is greater than any name, the name by which demons flee, sicknesses run. The name of Jesus, you need to call on him. Father, we worship you, we bless you. Thank you for this moment of teachings and this time in your word. We bless you for it. Even while we're praying, believer, Someone sent this question online. How does God help you when you have a lot of guilt in your heart? Here it is right now. Come here. You that has that guilt, come here right now. If it's something you've done, if it's something that you've done, then confess it. And here's where your faith comes in. To believe that God can forgive the vilest of sins the worst of sins. Here's how Isaiah put it in chapter one. I, Isaiah chapter one, he put it this way. Though your sins be as scarlet, though they, 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 have, they have stained your robe, God said, I'll make you as white as snow. I'll take away the stain of your sin. And if you want God to take away the stain of your sin. He can do it right now if you'll trust him. He can't. He, listen, you can't do it. He can. You can't do it. He can. You cannot clean your sins. He can. It was already too big for you if all you did was steal a pack of chewing gum. There was nothing you could do about it. But the blood of Jesus cleanses our sins. That's what this is about. That's what the cross is about. The book tells us in the book of Revelation at the end of time there'll come a point when all of this comes to a head. And Revelation chapter number one and, and verse seven describes it this way Behold, look, he comes on a cloud and every eye will see him even those who pierced his hand. And then in the next verse, he makes a proclamation. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And watch these two words. Jesus says in Revelation 1.8, the Almighty. And if you want to know him, this is your time to get to know him. Let that sin go. Guilt, okay, it's on the cross. He died for your guilt. You want to die for it too? Let me tell you this, he died for your guilt. There's nothing you can add to it, so let it go. Let it go. Now, I'm not saying there won't be any consequences. I'm not saying there's nothing you need to do to make up for it. There may be some apologies you owe. Maybe a price you pay, but on your heart and in your mind, let it go. Every tongue proclaim Jesus. Jesus. Let's all stand together right now. It may be that you're here and you don't know him, but you want to know him. Come on now. Come on. Step on out. Come here to the front. Someone else says, I know him already, but I've been away. I've been backslidden. I need to get it right with God. This is your time. This is your moment. Come right now. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't put it off. Certainly don't argue with the devil about it. Come on right now. Come on. I want to know Jesus for myself. Maybe you know him already, but you've been away. You've been backslidden. You want to get it right. Come on right now. There are people standing up here in the front who are ready to walk you through that process. You got to walk yourself to God. You got to go, but they'll show you the way. Come, come, if that's you. Third person, you're in good standing with God and you know it, but you want to join this church fellowship. If you're strong, 
you need us. If you're weak, you need us. If you're strong, we need you. Either way, we invite you to come. Come on now. Come on out. Come on now. You're the only living God. Sing it, saints. You're the only living God. You're the only. Tell him I love you. I love you. Lord, I love you. Oh, I love you. You're the only living God. Thank you, Father, that there's room, blessed room, at the cross of Calvary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. To my right is Elder Cass, and he and these women of God who stand, if you need to come, follow them out. Follow them straight out. In the name of Jesus. Give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Hey, guys. Hey, hey man. Thank you for watching. Well, Some of you made the best decisions in your life while you were watching the end of that message. You committed your life to Jesus Christ. And if you do, we are excited for you. We want to tell you congratulations. You just made the best decision of your life. That decision changed your destiny and your whole life from the moment you were born till right now was leading up to that moment. Now, we want to help you follow through with that decision to follow Jesus. At the bottom of your screen, you're going to see this website, lovelandchurch.org. If you go to our website, lovelandchurch.org, you'll see a link that says respond to God. Respond to God. Click on that link. You'll see a form that we want you to fill out, and it'll send us your information. We're not going to give that information to anybody else. All we're going to do with that information is reach out to you so that we can support you and help you follow through with your decision. You might have some questions now that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. What's next? How do I handle this? How do I talk to God? Those are all questions that we had ourselves when we came to Jesus, and we want to help you find the answers. So go to lovelandchurch.org, click on Respond to God, fill out the form, and we're going to get back with you very quickly so we can help you get to know your God better. God bless you. And come on and lead us in our closing prayer. Charlene Michelle. Charlene Michelle is that lady who I married a few years ago. Um, she, come to the center. I won't make you come all the way up, but if you'll come here to the center. You say you can't get all the way? All right. Praise God. Um, but Charlene is still processing the uh, passing of her mother. So she'd appreciate your prayers. And so she had determined she wasn't coming to church this morning, told me yesterday. Um, and yet when I was leaving home this morning, there was a lady at our door who was having a great, great problem. She said, Pastor, I need to talk to you, I need to talk to you. And I talked to her for a couple minutes, but I said, you know, I got a few other hundreds of other people that are waiting for me. And so I'm going to ask another person to talk to you. And it was Charlotte Michelle. So she wound up working anyhow. Um, Amen. Praise God. Dr. Brock, lead us in prayer. Father, sir. God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for our teacher today. We thank you for the blood that you gave and shared with us today. As we leave this place today, we ask that you be with us until we meet again in the name of the Father, the Son, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good.